Yesterday, the failed former president, the guy who's been impeached twice and indicted three times, maybe soon to be four, had a completely deranged and pathetic morning meltdown. And you can tell he is scared to death. Now, over the next day or two, it takes a long time to unpack this stuff. And we've got to get to Pence and we've got to get to Bill Barr. And there's so much here. But I want to give you a 30,000 foot view of the deranged scaredy cat meltdown that Donald Trump had this morning. Trump posting to his platform Truth Social, quote, I purposely didn't comment on Nancy Pelosi's very weird story concerning her husband, but now I can because she said something about me with glee that was really quite vicious. I saw a scared puppy, she said, as she watched me on television, like millions of others that didn't see that. I wasn't scared. Nevertheless, how mean a thing to say. She is a wicked witch whose husband's journey from hell starts and finishes with her. She is a sick and demented psycho who will someday live in hell. I don't think Trump believes in hell, but it is absolutely stunning that the guy who is supposedly the alpha male, the big, strong man where everyone else cries in his presence, but never him. He's going around saying Nancy Pelosi was mean to me. An 80 something year old woman was mean to me on my indictment day. Give me a break, guys. Give me a break. Trump then engaging caps lock and continuing, quote, no way I can get a fair trial or even close to a fair trial in Washington, D.C. There are many reasons for this, but just one is that I am calling for a federal takeover of this filthy and crime ridden embarrassment to our nation where murders have just shattered the all time record. Other violent crimes have never seen worse and tourists have fled. The federal takeover is very unpopular with potential area jurors, but necessary for safety, greatness and for all the world to see. Trump is arguing for a change of venue and his lawyer wants to send his case to West Virginia. We'll get to that. But that's what this post relates to. Trump continuing with caps lock still strongly engaged, quote, deranged Jack Smith and our highly partisan and very corrupt Department of Injustice could have brought this Biden opponent case years ago, but chose to wait and bring it right in the middle of my election campaign. No way. I hope you're watching America. Our country is being destroyed. Make America great again. And then again, Trump focusing on the change of venue, trothing, quote, there is no way I can get a fair trial with the judge assigned to the ridiculous freedom of speech, fair elections case. Everybody knows this, and so does she. We will be immediately asking for recusal of this judge on very powerful grounds. Yeah, she's not white and she is an Obama appointee. And likewise, for venue change out if DC, he means out of DC, DC. They want to move this case from DC to West Virginia. Later in the show, maybe tomorrow, if I don't get to it, I will have video for you of Trump's lawyer saying we need to bring the case somewhere more diverse like West Virginia. West Virginia happens to be 92 percent white. They mean a different kind of diversity. And by the way, they don't really mean diversity. They mean a state that is very Trumpy. That's what they now want. They are saying it openly. This is a meltdown from a scared person. You wouldn't think if I just showed you the text and absent any context, would you guess it's a nearly 80 year old former president writing these things with all capital letters, grammar and spelling errors up the wazoo? Maybe now you would. Six years ago, none of us would have ever guessed that. But that is where we are. After the break, Mike Pence is now admitting to the entire thing, the entire thing. And yet MAGA is yelling at Pence in a parking lot. We will we will have more from all aspects of the 2024 Republican primary. We will be in South Carolina. We will be in Iowa. Stay with us. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. What do you make of DeSantis, uh, DeSantis's response there? Well, like, look, I still don't think he answered it. Right. He lost. Well, we all know that as a matter of law, he lost the election. Yeah. Right. The, the deeper question and the one that I think he's dodging is, do you believe it was a full and fair election? Mm. That's really the question. And with respect to the interviewer, I think she let him off the hook. I mean, in the end, 
Did he lose? Of course he lost. And I believe he lost because he lost in a full and fair election. There's a lot of Republicans, I think the majority of Republicans in the country, do not believe it was a free and fair election. Yeah, well, I think that shows you the impact that Donald Trump has had um, on a lot of people. And that impact started on election night, Anderson. Because when he came out there that night at 2.30 in the morning and said, you know, um, we won the election, it's being stolen, uh, people assume that the President of the United States knows things they don't know. Mm. And, and if you're also inclined to be supportive, you want to give him the benefit of the doubt. And then that stuff has just, you know, seeped in. He has said any number of times, to me both personally and I've heard him say to others, you say something enough times, it becomes true. And that is clearly his philosophy on everything he's doing right now um, to the American people. And I know in your book you wrote about that moment as being the key moment for you that you were like, all right, enough. Yep. Um, we see how the former president is behaving, the rhetoric against the judge, the prosecution, even Mike Pence. Is this just free speech or more? Look, I mean, I think the judge will decide that ultimately. To me, though, there are always limits on free speech. I mean, this is the classic, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. I mean, there are limits on free speech. And by the way, when you're a criminal defendant out on bail, and let's focus on that, he is now out on bail in three different jurisdictions, New York, Florida, and Washington, D.C., we have a front runner in this race who's out on bail in three jurisdictions. It's pretty incredible. And and when you when what happens though when you're let out is that there are restrictions placed on you for you to stay out. And one of the restrictions that was placed on him was no contact or intimidation of potential witnesses. He's saying if you go after me, I'm coming after you. His lawyers are now saying that post was not that was generalized political speech not directed at anyone well of course that's what they're going to say because what they really feel like saying is oh my god i can't believe he did that again that you think that's what they said yes, privately, the to privately. Each other. their lawyers are like want to jump out the window mm -hmm. having to defend some of this stuff and, and here's the bottom line on it is that let's put aside if it's legal or illegal for a second is this the kind of conduct that the republican party or the american people want from someone who's going to be president. To, to, to send out tweets or, or posts, whatever they are, that he sends on True Social, saying this kind of stuff, um, threatening uh, people, uh, in trying to intimidate Mike Pence, trying to intimidate the judge. Um, you know, Mike Pence, as we know, this is he just falls in the line of Rex Tillerson and, and, and Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr and uh, all these folks who were were the best people ever when he hired them. Right. And then as soon as they say something that's And extraordinarily loyal also to him. Yes. And as soon as they disagree with him, then they become the worst people on earth. The things he wrote about Mike Pence, look, I'm running against Mike. I want to make sure I beat him and I become the Republican nominee. But he doesn't deserve that. He doesn't deserve those comments. The former president's lawyer, a new lawyer, John Loro, is defending the president's actions, obviously. He says a technical violation of the Constitution is not a violation of criminal law. Does that make sense to you? Um, you know, no. And he admits that the president violated his oath. Think about that. The president of the United States promises to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. His own lawyer has admitted he violated the Constitution. I want to play something he told Laura Ingram on Fox last week. What President Trump said is, let's go with option D. Let's just halt, let's just pause the voting and allow the state legislatures to take one last look and make a determination as to the as to whether or not the elections yeah. were handled fairly. That's constitutional law. That's not an issue of, of criminal activity. Did he admit uh, the president committed a crime? I mean, because the president is charged with corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding. Right. He did. And, and let me say what else he did. You know, he, he's opposite of what the evidence is. Mike Pence has been very clear about this. He said the president didn't ask him to halt or pause. He said that he was asked by the president to reverse it to reverse the result. And that's what Mike Pence is going to testify to. I suspect that's what he's already testified to in the grand jury. We don't know for sure because those matters are secret, but I suspect he hasn't said anything different to the grand jury. Do you think Mark Meadows is going to testify? Oh, I've said all along, I think Mark Meadows is already a cooperating witness. Um, he has all the looks of a cooperating witness running into coffee shops away from the press. And he's disappeared in the indictment. I mean, he's referenced once or twice. Right. But So when you didn't see Mark Meadows as an unindicted co-conspirator and you see absolutely no mention of him at all. How devastating do you think his testimony could be? 
it could be the worst testimony for him outside of the family members because Mark Meadows was with him constantly during and that period of time. And involved in all of it, in Georgia, in the electors. He was a very um, involved chief of staff, in my experience. He was he made sure he was in every meeting and every conversation. So, And, and we remember, there are hundreds of text messages mm. that he turned over to the special counsel that he kept. And many more that he kept. Yeah. The, the, the former president is saying he's going to ask the judge to be reassigned or recused, says he can't get a fair trial in D.C. Is any of that legitimate? They're, they're not going to move the trial. I mean, there's no, there's nothing he's shown. He's saying because she was appointed by Obama um, and she's been tough on January 6th defendants that that makes her, you know, biased. I, he's going to have to show something better than that to get a judge disqualified. And to get the venue moved, I don't know what the argument is. I don't like the jury pool, so I'm going to get the venue moved. I, that's not a basis for moving venue. Do you think the public has a right to see... I mean, do you think there should be cameras in the court in this? I've always thought there should be cameras in federal court. Um, I, I've thought that if we have them in state court, we should have them in federal court. I understand that there are times when people are performing for the cameras. But I think for the American people to see... Because I think, Anderson, the justice system works extraordinarily well in this country in the main. And I think the more we take the veil away from it on the federal side as well, and people get to see mm. the rights of defendants being acquitted, juries really considering all the evidence, deliberating, and then ultimately a verdict being rendered, I think that give more confidence in the system, not less. In terms of, uh, you, you know, I don't know if you saw it, uh, former uh, Attorney General Bill Barr told Kaylin Collins last week, the, the DOJ case is legitimate. The former president, quote, should not be anywhere near the Oval Office. The same interview, he didn't rule out voting for the former president in a one-on-one -on -one matchup against Biden. What do you, does that make sense to you? Well, I... You I know, understand he's not a entirely, loyal Republican. Not entirely. And I think that this is something that people have been avoiding. Um, as you know, a lot of people, some were in the race, some were outside the race, in talking about this. And I think part of it is because there's real serious discontent with President Biden, sure. concerns about his age and his health and all the rest of that. So I think that's why some people do it that way. But I do think that Bill Barr, to be fair to him, has been as clear as any former member of his cabinet on the things that he said about the president, yeah. how the president conducted himself, and how he does His critique believe. has been devastating. Yes, and, and so I think, I think look, if, if Bill wants to take that position, I think we need to give him a pass on that one, because in the end, he has put forward substantive facts as to why Donald Trump shouldn't be president again. This new CBS News YouGov poll, 91% of MAGA Republicans and 83% of non-MAGA Republicans think the indictments and investigation against Trump are trying to stop his campaign. The argument you've been making consistently, and especially now, I mean, are you worried that it's not... I mean, how do you make traction with those voters? Because the, the, the argument to those voters is these are two separate questions. People are discontent with what they've seen Anderson out of DOJ. Um, and, and I can't say I blame them in terms of what happened with Hillary Clinton, or rather did not happen, and what they see now with the Hunter Biden plea being rejected, seemingly because the judge thought it was an unfair plea deal that favored Hunter Biden. If you're a Republican, you say to yourself, this looks, this looks fishy. So th I think that's where those numbers come from. The separate question is, regardless of that, regardless if you think that his prosecutions are politically motivated or not, there's very little argument about the conduct, mm -hmm. the underlying conduct that led to it. Inviting people to, to Washington on January 6th saying it's going to be wild. Telling them the election is stolen when it isn't urging them to march up to Capitol Hill and saying, you know, I'll go up there with you. I knew listening to that, he would never go. If Donald Trump's worried about breaking a fingernail, he doesn't go, let alone be in danger with people who are being violent. Then he goes back to the White House and watches people commit violent acts at the U.S. Capitol and does nothing. If you're not morally responsible then for what happened on January 6th, having done that, forget legally. Mm. Is that the kind of person you want behind the desk in the Oval Office? Whether you believe he should go to jail or not, whether you believe he's criminal or not, is that the bar now for being president of the United States? Well, not only he may have committed a crime, but we think it might be politically motivated. That's why I say put that stuff aside and look at the conduct. Look at the conduct in that case. Look at the conduct in the, in the documents case where he was asked for 18 months quietly, privately yeah. to give them back. He didn't. And look at, look at the conduct even in the Stormy Daniels case, which I believe is a ridiculous prosecution to have been brought. But do we really want a president who's paying off a porn star during an election to hide the fact that he had an affair with her while he was married. Mm. Like, 
that shouldn't probably be the standard for what we want behind the Oval Office. So that's my argument, and that's why those numbers don't worry me nearly as much as you suspect they might. So we begin with the escalating battle between former President Trump's legal team and special counsel Jack Smith. In a late night filing, the judge overseeing the 2020 election interference case called for a hearing before the end of the week at issue that proposed protective order. The move comes after a series of tit for tat motions by the special counsel's office and lawyers defending Trump. Yesterday, the former president's legal team asked for a less restrictive alternative to Smith's protective order, arguing it violates Trump's First Amendment rights. The special Council fired back, accusing Trump of trying, of attempting to try the case in the media. At least one former federal prosecutor believes that Smith's request is appropriate in this case. What this is about is the government is trying to protect the integrity of the judicial process. You might remember last week, federal prosecutors warned that the release of details or grand jury transcripts could have a chilling effect on witnesses. And they cited the former president's social media posts as a cause for concern. For his part, Trump has pleaded not guilty. We have team coverage of the latest in this legal tug of war. Joining us, NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Ken, let's start with you. So Trump's team asked the judge to narrow the scope of the government's request. What are the specific changes that they're looking for here? Well, good morning, Joe and Savannah. The first thing to say is this is not really about Donald Trump's ability to speak about the case. He retains that ability. This is about what he and his team do with the massive amount of evidence that prosecutors are proposing to turn over in what's known as discovery. And that includes witness testimony, records that have been subpoenaed through a grand jury, all kinds of very personal and sensitive information. And in almost every case in a criminal investigation, a protective order is blanketed over that information, forbidding either side from making it public. That's just normal. That's standard. It's normally not challenged. In this case, Donald Trump and his legal team have tried to narrow the proposed protective order in a way that would let them release a lot of information, including about witnesses who testified before the grand jury and gave interviews to the special counsel, and that really worries the special counsel. And they've, the, the special counsel asserts that this would essentially allow Donald Trump to try this case in the media the way they said his lawyer attempted to do over the weekend when he went on all five Sunday shows. And so uh, now the judge has decided, instead of just ruling uh, on the competing set of briefs, she's going to have a hearing about this. Uh, it remains to be seen exactly what she will do. But one thing the Trump team has done here is they've successfully uh, bought themselves about a week of delay, which ultimately may be their strategy in this case in all things, guys. Danny, let's bring you in here. So as Ken just mentioned, we saw his legal team on all these Sunday shows. Of course, the judge and prosecutors have been targets of Donald Trump himself online on his platform, Truth Social. And while a lot of those posts are not directly related to these arguments, over the protective order, he's obviously discussing these people, calling them by name, things like that. How likely is it that that particular issue will come up at the hearing? How much we've seen from the former president online? It definitely will. In fact, it's a central theme of the government's argument. And it's a fair argument. Look, Judge, uh, we've had concerns about Donald Trump speaking and saying inappropriate things. And here's exhibit A, B, and C. And it's only been about 72 hours. And so I think that's a strong argument for the government. But I also have to caution that, yes, protective orders are common. Protective orders are a good thing. You don't want Rule 6 grand jury material out there. But at the same time, consider this. The defense is having to make this decision on these documents, what should and should not be disclosed, uh, before they even see the documents. And more than that, uh, when this is a very unique case because so much of the material is already known. When we read the indictment, a lot of us were thinking, oh, yeah, I've heard about all of this before from the January 6th committee and then arguably even back during the second impeachment. So the question becomes, just because it's a document that the government turns over, is that now something that Trump cannot uh, reveal, even if he already had it, even if it came from him, between him, a text message? Uh, it's really... it's. It's a much more tricky case because so much of the material has been public for literally years. And so does it suddenly become something that needs to be protected by virtue of the fact that the government had it on its flash drive when it turned it over to the defendant? So I think this is a trickier issue than people are making it out to be. But it seems that every former federal prosecutor in America disagrees. 
So, I mean, Ken, even though we've had an indictment, the investigation continues. Now we have former NYPD Police Commissioner Bernie Carrick met with investigators yesterday talking about Rudy Giuliani's alleged role in efforts to overturn the election. So two questions here. First, how does Carrick fit into the case? And then what else have you heard about the ongoing investigations into those anonymous or at least somewhat anonymous unindicted co-conspirators who were mentioned in the indictment? Before I answer that, Joe, a quick note on Danny's point. The proposed protective order does not forbid Donald Trump from making public things that are already in the public domain. Now, on Bernie Carrick, um, look, he was a chief investigator for Rudy Giuliani, who we believe is co-conspirator, unindicted co-conspirator number one in this election suppression indictment. And so prosecutors want to talk to him about everything he was doing to explore uh, what we now know are bogus allegations of fraud in the 2020 election, what he told Giuliani, what Giuliani was doing. Carrick has also turned over hundreds of documents to the prosecution, and it just shows that they continue to investigate this case and potentially the roles of those unindicted co-conspirators who remain very much at risk of being charged in this case, Joe and Savannah. Danny, let's turn now, if you don't mind, before we let you guys go, take a little gear shift here, talk about the Mar-a-Lago documents case for a minute. So totally different investigation, different indictment. In a court filing yesterday, the judge overseeing that case, that's Judge Aileen Cannon, our viewers might remember, she asked the DOJ why there is a second grand jury in D.C. that's also looking into this documents case. Again, this is the Florida one we've seen. How unusual is it to have an out-of-state grand jury continuing to investigate after indictments have happened? It's a federal indictment, but we know that we're seeing all that kind of activity happen down in Florida. Well, it's unusual because it's such an unprecedented case, and the logic apparently is simply because this the, uh, the other location is a possible situs where some of the uh, possible criminal activity occurred. And that's true. And arguably, there could even be additional charges that are not duplicative of the charges in Mar-a-Lago, in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Uh, but it is a fair question as to whether or not this, this investigation is going to continue and whether or not there are even going to be uh, possible criminal charges. And I, I don't know exactly how that would work, except that you can imagine that there may be activities that happened in D.C. that could even be charged under the same statutes as the Mar-a-Lago documents case, but they simply happen. The events happened uh, in D.C., and there could be events that that grand jury has discovered that we don't even know about. So uh, it's a fair inquiry. Ken Delaney and Danny Savalos, thank you both. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app. Now, I've got Congressman Jamie Raskin. Thanks so much for coming back on. Hey, it's my pleasure to be with you, Brian. You were the lead impeachment manager in Trump's impeachment for inciting his supporters to wage an insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th. With this week's indictment and arrest for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election, does this feel like it's come full circle for you? Like, what's your general response to the latest news? It feels like a great vindication of the rule of law in American democracy to me. Um, it was great to see it spelled out in black and white in print in the indictment that, um, you know, all of the factual allegations supporting the idea that Trump uh, conspired to interfere with federal proceedings, specifically the um, counting of electoral college votes in joint session on January 6th, that he um, that he conspired also to um, essentially counterfeit the electoral process and um, uh, that he conspired to violate the civil rights of the people, specifically the voting rights. And, you know, it was Abraham Lincoln who said that insurrection is an assault on the leaders in the democracy. Now, you also sat on the January 6th committee. Can you discuss the extent to which your work on that committee kind of informed the indictment that we saw? Well, I, I'm starting to think of it this way, that uh, the January 6th select committee gave America the facts and uh, special counsel Jack Smith has delivered the law with respect to uh, crimes that were committed. Um, we did make a referral. In fact, I chaired that subcommittee we had to prepare to make a referral of criminal charges. Um, I think three of the four charges that we recommended were um, embodied in the indictment. One was not, which was 
uh, aiding and abetting and giving aid and comfort to insurrection. Uh, we think there was overwhelming evidence for that when uh, Trump continued to tweet out his support when he uh, tweeted in the middle of the riot that uh, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done, when he praised everybody at the end, saying they were um, American patriots, great patriots and heroes and so on, and said, never forget this day. So we think that there was lots of evidence for that. We understand that um, the statute um given the fact that Donald Trump is in a class by himself, had never really been used in this way before. Um, and I think they were nervous about that. And I think they were also um, thinking properly that that would open the door for Trump to claim that somehow his free speech was being violated, which is ridiculous. They're trying that anyway. But um, that's silly. Everybody understands he's being charged for his criminal offenses, conspiring to obstruct um, a federal proceeding, um, conspiring... Uh, to defraud the American people of a real election, conspiring to violate everybody's voting rights. Um, and obviously, you know, that kind of criminal conduct conspiracy is brigaded with speech. The court has always recognized that. I mean, when you conspire to rob a bank, you talk about robbing the bank, but that doesn't make an act of free speech. <laughs> right, um, right. And it's the same thing about storming the Capitol or substituting the real electoral process with a counterfeit one. Why do you think that they're relying on this, you know, tenuous defense that this is all an attack on, on Trump's free speech rights? Given how easily debunkable they are in, in the public sphere. I mean, Jack Smith included on page two of a 45 page indictment that Trump had every right, not only not only to say whatever he wanted, but even to lie about the election. Well, obviously, Smith predicted that that would be his, Trump's maneuver. I mean, he's got one move. And so, of course, he's going to be dancing it, you know, but it's not very compelling. Um you know, the, the the criminal law distinguishes between speech and conduct, and um, he's not being prosecuted for any of his speech. He's being prosecuted for the criminal conduct he engaged in. And there might may have been speech that enabled it at certain points. But again, you know, there's a, a lot of crimes necessarily involve speech, like insider trading uh, almost always involves uh, speech like antitrust violations when companies get together to fix prices, that's all based on speech, but it's the conduct that's being punished. So, you know, they might try and confuse people about that, but they're not going to confuse uh, any judge or any court about that. I mean, we've been around the track in proving that point, and th they're basically saying there's a First Amendment defense to conspiracy, which is absurd. On the topic of conspiracy, six unnamed co-conspirators were included in the indictment. We already know who most of them are and why they're listed in that indictment. You know, for Trump to be involved in a conspiracy, you have to list those who he conspired with. But they've not been indicted thus far. So do you imagine that we'll see an indictment against them um, in this case or in a separate case or at all? Well, I mean, I have no special insider knowledge about you know, any plans that may exist or don't or that don't exist with respect to future prosecutions. Um, you know, it occurred to me reading it that, um, you know, it at least becomes, um, a, a, you know, a mitigating factor at someone's sentencing if they voluntarily cooperate in other prosecutions. And so, um Donald Trump was obviously the ringleader and the central actor here. I mean, the various right wing groups had obtained permits to protest on January the 20th. They were planning to assemble against Joe Biden's inauguration. And Trump convinced them to move their protests from the 20th of January to the 6th of January. And he was the one who tried to convince everybody this wasn't over, that you know, things could still be moved if Mike Pence just had the courage to do what needed to be done. And so he was the one who turned the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in American history, including the Civil War, into a moment of cataclysmic violent conflict. That was all his doing. So, um, you know, I think it would make sense to say that uh, you know, he went out and found this clown show of 
uh, lawyers to tell him what he wanted to hear. And if one or two of them wanted to tell the truth, uh, that would make sense. And that's something that should be considered, um, you know, when they face uh, their own prosecution. Yeah. So, you know, this this case really was built for speed in the sense that Donald Trump is the only, uh, you know, named indicted person in this uh, in this indictment. With that said, do you agree with Jack Smith's decision to basically not indict these other co-conspirators in service of a, a, a faster prosecution for Donald Trump? I mean, if they had included six other people in this prosecution, God knows that this thing would have languished for a, a lot longer than it's probably going to take now, just focusing narrowly on one defendant. Yeah, I mean, delay and postpone is the name of the game for Donald Trump. And uh, so I would not second guess in any way the prosecutorial decision to set it up as they have and to move as quickly as they can. There's clearly enough time to prosecute a single individual for these offenses um, over the next year. We've got the Mike Pence's out there who are able to acknowledge what Trump did and, and how it was wrong and how it was illegal and un unconstitutional and yet still managed to defend him or, or cast the DOJ's case against him as being unfair. What does that say to you about the state of the Republican field? Well, I mean, it's an incoherent posture that Mike Pence has put himself into and an embarrassing and humiliating one. Um, you know, I mean, he acts as if I mean, he he obviously made the right decision on January 6th, but he acts as if this is some kind of uh, superficial intellectual disagreement between him and Donald Trump because he doesn't want to offend Trump supporters anymore. These are the people who are yelling, hang Mike Pence and bring him out. Um, so. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know what to say. Um, uh, the, you know, I think he'd be in a much stronger position um, if he said there's some things that we did that I'm proud of. But uh, Donald Trump, um, you know, b blew the the doors off the hinges on January 6th and has clearly proven himself not fit for public office or public service. And I'm going to go against it. But instead, it's just this constant mealy mouthed. Uh, effort to have it both ways and to attack the Department of Justice for doing their job. Would he really not want Donald Trump to be prosecuted for these crimes against America? I mean, there were Republicans who were describing what happened on January 6th as terrorism. And Mitch McConnell, even after he voted to acquit on the totally fraudulent grounds that the Senate lacked jurisdiction to conduct a trial over a former president, uh, which was a matter we disposed of on the first day when we went over to the Senate. Um, even even McConnell um, took great, great pains to point out that Donald Trump still could be prosecuted, indicating he should be prosecuted in a court of law. And in fact, that was the line of Trump's most uh, diehard supporters during the impeachment trial saying, look, if he committed crimes, then that's something that he should be prosecuted for. But, you know, it shouldn't be done this way. Uh, the Senate doesn't actually have jurisdiction. That that argument, by the way, cut against more than two centuries of precedent. And also in the law of the case was something we'd already settled in a motion on the very first day we were over there. And yet they kept going back to it, which I think makes uh, Trump's 57 to 43 uh, acquittal, even though a majority of the senators thought he was guilty, we didn't get to 67. Um, that makes his acquittal, I think, the greatest case of jury nullification in American history, because the people voting for acquittal, like McConnell, were getting up and saying he was essentially guilty afterwards. To wrap up the Trump stuff, can you speak to the prospect that we could see Trump get convicted and even sentenced to prison and still be the leading contender for the Republican nomination for president? Well, um, you know, what are the constitutional requirements for running for president? You've got to be 35. You've got to be a born U.S. citizen. Uh, you also cannot have committed insurrection or rebellion. Um, against the government under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which disqualifies you from ever serving again. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a very 
uh, rocky, winding, twisting path to get to him uh, running for president again. But uh, he, you know, clearly exercises a stranglehold spell over the Republican Party, which is operating a lot more like an authoritarian cult of personality than it is Abraham Lincoln's political party, which was an anti-slavery, pro-freedom, anti-know-nothing, pro-immigration party. Um, so, um, you know, but but here's where we are. Um, I, I do believe that um, the vast majority of the people reject this kind of authoritarianism and know-nothingism. Um, and, uh, you know, Biden beat Trump by 7 million votes in 2020. And What's the difference between 20 and 24? Well, we've just added 20 or 25 million new voters who are young people who are not interested in the party of climate denialism, um, you know, uh, marijuana, uh, criminal uh, drug enforcement, authoritarianism, um, anti-choice, uh, reproductive tyranny. Uh, I mean, the GOP has nothing for the young people of America who are interested in freedom and democracy. Um, so I just think that uh, Joe Biden's margins are increasing dramatically with the demographic um, addition of millions of young people voting. And it probably doesn't help him that he's got a... Uh... <laughs> God knows how many charges uh, hanging around his neck. By the time the election actually does roll around, by the time people start voting, he'll have likely four indictments and maybe around 100 charges that he's contending with. So that probably uh, isn't going to redound to his electoral benefit either. Um, you know, last month you decided not to run for the U.S. Senate. Can you speak a little on what helped you reach that decision? Um, I do think we're in the fight of our lives. Uh to defend democratic institutions and our freedom against um, authoritarianism in America and all over the world. Um, you know, the the heart of the struggle right now, of course, is in the brutal imperialist Russian invasion of Ukraine and attack against the Ukrainian people. But um, Donald Trump, who is uh, Vladimir Putin's fellow traveler, and a, a fellow champion of illiberal democracy like Orban in Hungary, um, uh, it, they have set themselves at war against democratic institutions. And so for me, the only question was, am I better being in a situation where I'm the lead Democrat on the oversight committee? Um, and if we win the House back, chair the oversight committee and fighting to win the House back and helping Democrats all over the country. I'm on my way to Minnesota and then Colorado and then Michigan. And I'm out there working to build big, robust Democratic majorities. Or am I better off campaigning in Maryland to go to the Senate where, you know, I don't even know if I'd be able to get on the Judiciary Committee. They don't have an oversight committee like that. And so it was a tough call because I love my state very much. And I love the idea of being able to go, you know, statewide in campaign. There's still people bugging me about it every day. So uh, maybe it's not completely over. But at this point, I feel like I'm in the right place to be uh, fighting this crucial battle for American democracy. And finally, let's end with this. You've announced that your cancer is in remission, thank God. Um, how are you doing? How do you feel? Is your life back to normal? Well, thank you for asking. I, you know, um, I've completed three months of recovery since um, I finished my chemotherapy. Um, the great news is I did a PET scan and there's still no sign of any cancer cells, which is awesome. Um, I don't have nausea and I don't have neuropathy. And every day I'm uh, regaining my physical strength. Um, and, you know, if I thought maybe I could be doing all the oversight stuff and fighting Trump and running for Senate and making my recovery, then maybe I would have just tried to do it all. But at least yeah. uh, when I made the decision a couple of months ago, I thought that that was too much, you know. Yeah, well... Uh, Congressman, obviously your position as an impeachment manager and as a member of the January 6th committee has played a, a monumental role in the indictment that we're seeing now and in finally witnessing um, the first steps of accountability against Donald Trump. So as always, thank you for the work that you've been doing. If there is one person who exemplifies integrity, it's you. So uh, with that said, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for your kind words, Brian. Uh, hang tough and keep up the great work, man.
There is nothing worse than getting hot and sweaty at night when you sleep, but it won't happen again with the eight sleep pod cover.